and I'm going to share the screen there. Everybody see my screen okay? Okay, good. Thumbs up. Thank you. Okay, so I'm um, going to talk about a few things today, and then we'll give some time for questions for the exam, which is next week. Uh, wow, this term is just flying by. Um, so let's start off by talking about enumeration classes. Now, in Java and C and some other languages, there are these interesting enum types. Actually, I can't remember if C has enum types. I'm blanking on that. C++ does, but uh, I can't remember if C does. Uh, but uh, going back to Pascal was the first time I saw these things, and they're fairly useful to use as values. So in Kotlin, you define it as a num class. You don't just say in num. And inside there, let's say that I wanted to represent suits of cards. Then I can have spades, hearts, diamonds, and clubs. So that might represent the, the, the suit of a card that I'm going to represent. And then I can just reference that like anything else. So I could have a data class card, and I could have a rank, which is a integer, and then a suit, which is of type suit, something kind of like that. And then if I want to define these, I could say val card equals new card. Whoops, what am I saying new? You can tell I've written a little bit of Java code recently. Uh, maybe I'll say it's the one of clubs, something kind of like that. And this is basically how you would define that. And this just defines a discrete set of values that we can use. And what's really nice about these is you can have a switch statement on this. When statement, wow, I actually said switch statement. Yeah, you can tell I actually have been doing some, uh, some Java, unfortunately. And I'm going to say when card.suit, I'm going to do something. And I'm going to take a look at the different values of that. If I hit an Alt Enter on that when, I'm going to say add remaining branches. And it fills in all of the values of that suit for me. And this is an exhaustive list. So I could say something like val result equals. And then in each of these cases, maybe I say one, two, three, four. Not super useful, but if this wasn't exhaustive, if I just commented one out for a minute, you're going to see that the when is going to complain. It's going to say if you're using when as an expression, you've got to handle all the cases. So in this case, I missed a case, and I could either put an else there or explicitly list them out. Now, if you're doing an enumeration and really doing discrete things for each value, then you're going to want to actually have each of them listed out. If you're only handling a couple of them, you know, like maybe. I just wanted to say spades and hearts, I'm going to assign a one, everything else I'm going to assign a two. I could do something kind of like this. Whoops. And it's still exhaustive because I'm handling all possible values there. And when you're doing enumerations, it's possible to handle all those values. You can't ever add anything to an enumeration at runtime uh, or throughout the rest of your program. Once you define that enumeration, boom, you're done. Every value inside here has the same functions, has the same properties as any other value. That's really what makes enumerations work. And enumerations are actually fairly similar to the way they're implemented in Java. Uh, what we can do with this to make it a little bit more interesting is we can actually add some features to it. So we could add some, some uh, properties, we could add some functions. So maybe I wanted to have a val fancy name. And the fancy name will say, I am spades, I am hearts, I am diamonds, I am clubs. That's not super fancy, but hey, what the heck. Um, notice that this is actually adding a property to every one of these suits. So each of the values is going to have some value for that property. And this is when I'd start to split these up onto separate lines. Because now we're going to need to actually specify that. Note that it's in the constructor for fancy name. I am spades. And then we can do something similar. Whoops. I am hearts. I am diamonds. I am clubs. 
So that is the fancy name. That's kind of a weird fancy name, but hey, it's just showing you can you can add properties to this. Every value has the same properties available to it. So now down inside here, I could say, well, maybe I'll take this and if it's spades or hearts, I'm going to say card dot, uh, what was the, oh, actually card dot suit. Yeah, that fancy name. Otherwise, I'm going to say I am a lowly card, something like that. So he doesn't feel so fancy because he's not as high ranked as spades or hearts. Um, so doing something like this, you can get that value. Note that card.suit, all we know about it is that it is of type suit. We don't know which specific value it is. And then there's the fancy name there. Now we can also add functions to these. So we can come down here and try to add function foo, but notice what happens when I just start typing in fun foo. I'm getting a little red squiggle over here. And this is one of the very few spots in Kotlin where you have to use a semicolon. It needs to have some separation between the list of values and any type of functions you're gonna assign here. So this is one of those cases where we have to put a semicolon. And it's a little disappointing but it is what it is. So that separates the list from the actual functions we're defining here. So if we wanted to have a function that said, um, let's actually say if, if I trump a different, different uh, suit. If you've ever played uh, bridge, the idea of, of trumping something is being a, a higher value card. And so in this case, we're just saying a certain suits trump other suits. So in this case, I'm going to say um, suit, suit there. And we're gonna be returning true or false. And the way I'm gonna determine if they trump it, I could just go ahead and use a when and do a bunch of comparisons, but that's kind of gross. If, however, I were smart about defining the order of these spades, hearts, diamonds, clubs, which I if I'm remembering correctly, that is the highest rank order. Spades is higher than hearts, is higher than diamonds, is higher than clubs. Then what I can do is I can ask for the ordinal position of these. This guy is going to have ordinal position 0, 1, 2, and 3. And so here I could just say equals ordinal is greater than suit.ordinal. And actually, let me rename this to be other suit. Something kind of like that. So, uh, oops, less, not greater than, less. So I trump the other suit if I come up earlier in this list of positions. So now I have a function here that I could come down here. And let's say that I have two cards I'm going to find. So I'm going to have card one and card two. And let's just say this is the one of spades. And then I can just print Lin card one trumps, oops, card one suit trumps card two and vice versa. Oops, that suit. I'm only looking at the, the suits. I'm not looking to see if a card has a higher value than any other card here. Um, oh, these need to have those guys put back in there. There we go. So let's go ahead and run this. Now we should get a false and then a true, I believe, on that. Yep, we get a false and a true out of those two guys, um, just based on the suit rankings there. Now the point here is that every instance, so every one of these values, spades, hearts, diamonds, and clubs, has the same properties, has the same functions available to it. And that can be pretty useful. I've done some neat things with this in Java before, um, mainly when I'm defining like a state machine. I came up with an approach for defining a state machine inside an enumeration in Java, and it's really, really readable. 
um, if you do it right. I mean, there's there's ways to make it so that it's it's completely unreadable. Um, but by doing some little uh, interesting formatting tricks where I might have multiple things on a given line that you normally wouldn't when you're coding, you can actually make it look very much like a table. Don't want to get into that right now, uh, but just wanted to kind of mention enums are really super useful. Now we've seen sealed classes and sealed interfaces as well. And what's really cool about sealed classes and sealed interfaces is it's kind of like taking this enumeration and putting it on some serious steroids. Because now, instead of every single value having the exact same functions and, and properties, you can vary them. So if we come off to this week two package here, let me give myself a main, or week 602, let's say that we wanted to have a little bit of variation in things, but we still wanna have that capability to have things be exhaustive. Uh, what we can do here is start off with a, let's say, sealed interface mammal. Let's just start off with that. Now let me um, talk about one of the reasons why you might want to use a sealed interface versus a sealed class. If I came up here and said sealed class um, mammal, let's say mammal one, and then had a val name string passed into it, that can be really useful because we're defining that property once it's actually a property that all man, mammals are going to have. Pretty nice. The negative on there is if we come down and try to do a data class for one of the subtypes. So if I wanted a data class human one, and I wanted to make that a mammal one. Now what I'm going to need to do here is this mammal here, I'm going to need to hit Alt-Enter and say add constructor parameters for mammal one. Boom. But now notice there's a little bit of a problem here because the data class expects the parameters coming in to be values. They expect them to be properties. But if I float over this guy, he's going to say the primary constructor must only have property parameters. And then all of those go into the two string, the equals, and the hash code functions, as well as the copy and the component end functions. So this actually is problematic if we do something like this. We can't really have data classes if we have a sealed class with properties in it that are values, uh, with properties in the constructor. So what I usually like to do to, to get around this is to go with a sealed interface, which is a little bit newer than sealed classes. But this is one of the reasons why they wanted to add sealed interfaces, because this particular example wouldn't work. Um, this is problematic. Cannot have data class subtypes uh, with the shared properties. So what we do is we define a sealed interface instead of a sealed class on this guy. And in here, I'm going to say val name colon string. And what that means is that anybody who's going to be a mammal has to have a name. So now I'm going to come in here and let's add in, I'm going to use the data class here data class human, and he is going to implement mammal. Now, obviously, it's not going to work yet because I haven't put that name in there. So if I come up to float over this, it's going to say, hey, he's not abstract, and he doesn't implement the abstract name that you defined in the interface. So what I'm going to do is hit Alt-Enter on this guy and say implement as construction constructor parameters. Boom. Now, you'll notice that this is a wee bit more than this. We had to add the override val in front of it. But we also don't have to pass the, the name to the mammal one. So it's a little teeny bit more to actually write, but it now allows us to have a data class for that guy. And we can do the same kind of thing for cat and for dog. And now they all have names. Fantastic. Because we're doing a sealed interface, the only place that we can actually have these subclasses is inside the same module that I'm compiling. Now, in this project, I have a single module. If I wanted to, I could define a new module by right-clicking on the top-level project. And let's, let me crunch this down so you can actually see it. There we go. I'm going to make it a 
Kotlin JVM module. And let's call it um, data. How's that for nice and generic? So inside my data module, notice that it has like a little, little uh, symbol there on that folder. I am going to, what does this build doc gradle looks like? So he has Java and Kotlin, that's good. So I'm gonna say, give me a new directory called source. Give me a new directory underneath there called main. And a new directory under there called Kotlin. And we'll create a package. Um, is he still building or what is he doing? Plugin request for plugin already on the class path must not include a version. Well, that's interesting. Let's see about that. You can just go kaboom. I wonder if that hadn't been the case, if it would have created the uh, source main Kotlin for me automatically. I'll never know now because I just uh, created those guys. Um, so in underneath Kotlin, I'm going to say new package week six data. And then inside there, I could do sealed classes and sealed interfaces. So maybe I have inside here a sealed interface that I'll call mammal. I'll call it mammal. Uh, let's call it um, data mammal. Ooh, that's awful. So I'm defining my data mammal. And he's going to have a val name. And then inside there, I could create a new class called data human. These are awful, awful names. Don't, don't use this. I'm just using it to distinguish between the ones that I already created. And he's going to be a data class who is going to implement data mammal. There we go. So now we have our data, data human. Let's create a data dog and a data cat. Ooh, these names are just causing me so much pain right now. So inside this module, I've defined this set of data that I'm dealing with here. And I can use that module in the other one. Now, the, pl the thing I have to do to set this up inside uh, uh, Gradle, if I come down to settings.gradle, this is going to tell me which uh, uh, modules I'm going to be building. So in this case, notice that it says include data. It's actually using that as part of the build. This doesn't make data available to us as far as having, having uh, um, uh, type definitions available to us, but it just says include him as part of the build. If I commented that out and then refresh, notice that IntelliJ is going to not treat that as a module, so it doesn't have that special icon anymore. If I ran a build, it would only build my outer project that I've set up. As soon as I add him in there and then refresh it, we're going to see that little icon return up here. And ID modules below that there's that's interesting. Um, so yeah, that's not really a module. Um, so this guy up here, he has the data that we've defined, and I want to make that available to my outer project. Now, I should note that normally if you have submodules like this, you'd have a top level that just includes all the submodules. And instead of having this source be directly at the top level, I'd have another module nesting it. But what I'm going to do is I'm going to go to the overall build.gradle, and we'll see down here is there's this dependencies block. This is pulling in third-party libraries. You can also use it to pull in modules like this. So I can say implementation colon data, whoops, project colon data, something kind of like that. And what this does is it looks for a sub-project named data inside the same project. So this should make the uh, definitions in there available to us. So if I go ahead and compile that, and now I'm going to go back to my week 02. Let's try using that in my main. So I'm going to say val data human equals data human. And I'll just say Scott in there. And boom, it's pulled that in for me. And that's fantastic. But watch what happens if I try to extend data mammal. 
So I come in here and I say data class, data uh, platypus. And he's going to be a data mammal. Let's see what happens on this. So first of all, data mammal here, it says, inheritance of sealed classes or interfaces from a different module is prohibited. That's the key to a sealed class or a sealed interface. In something like this, the only place that you can define these extensions is inside the same module that defines the sealed class or sealed interface. So it kind of treats the module as a container for enumeration values. So we're defining all these different classes or objects, we can use objects there, and they have to be defined inside that data module. That's a really good thing because now it's exhaustive and you can limit exactly what you're doing with things. So questions on that before I move on? Okay, so now that we've got those, I'm going to pretend that this data module doesn't exist. sealed interface from a different module. Okay, and actually I should put this back in here. Data class, data platypus, data mammal, and whoops. Can I extend sealed class interface from different module? And I'll let you in on a little secret. This is the first time I actually tried that just to verify that that's behavior is, is the correct behavior. Uh, I thought I should probably do that at some point just to prove the point that, yep, you can't do this. So consider yourself lucky you get to see a wonderful example like that. Uh, but it, it lets us define those and make sure that's the only set of data that we have. So let's take a look at these subclasses here. Right now they're all doing the exact same thing. So I could have done this exact same thing using um, an enumeration and it wouldn't have been any different. I mean it basically would give us the same type of thing. The main difference here is I can now have multiple instances. If I had defined these as objects so if I came in here and said object, oh, what might be a, let's say Seymour. Is it O-U-R? Uh, we'll say Seymour from uh, Little Shop of Horrors. And he's going to be a mammal. And we have to implement that, that name there. And in this case, We only have a single instance of Seymour. We never have more than one. Versus these humans, we could create as many instances as we want to, but we can't add new classes outside of this module. This can be really useful, like we saw for the response objects coming back from some kind of API, where we can limit those to a loaded object to tell us that things are happening, a timeout object, an error class, which has some data that has to vary per instance. In this case, we might have multiple humans with different names. This is a very special human who he's the only one who can ever be called Seymour is what we're trying to say here. Now, we don't have any guard here protecting against that, but we could add some code in there to protect against that if we want and blow up if the name is Seymour. So we'll look at these classes here, and the big difference with the enumeration is that you can have multiple instances of these but we're limiting the subtypes. So now what if we wanted to add in specific behaviors? So kind of like we did in that assignment where we had the uh, number of mice slain for the cats and other types of you know, special properties, we can add in special properties or special behaviors that are different for each of these classes. So if I came in here 
and maybe I add in the nickname like we did before. He's not an override though, because he's just new data. And maybe in the class, I'm not gonna have the number of slain mice, but maybe I wanna have a function here. I'll say meow. And he's going to print Lynn, meow. And then maybe the dog is going to have a fun bark. And he is going to print Lynn, they woof. He's a French dog. All dogs are French in this example. So now we have slightly different behaviors for each of these subtypes. And this is where the sealed classes and interfaces really diverge big time from uh, an enumeration, is you can actually have the different subtypes, or even if you wanted to, different objects here. I'll go ahead and keep Seymour around for a little bit. And we will say fun sing. And he will go Printlin. Oh, poor. All my life I've always been poor. So he could like sing his stuff like that. And so if you've never seen Little Shop of Horrors, if you ever get a chance to see it live, it's a fantastic show. Uh, my son played Seymour in it in high school, and I was just dying. It's just, it's awesome to have your, your kid be the lead in the play like that. Um, and then imagine yourself in the play, because I, I, if I were in a play, I would love to be in Little Shop. Um, so uh, we have uh, Seymour defined there. He has some different functionality as well. So it's not just limited to classes. You can set up an object that has some slightly different behavior. Now let's take a look at how we use this stuff. So we go down to our main here. We can have, um, let me actually just pass it to a function. Um, use mammal. And we'll come up here and say val mammal equals human Scott. And I have to give myself a nickname. Scooter was my nickname in second grade because Muppet Show was out and I had some friends down the street who I wore glasses and my name was close enough to Scott, so I was Scooter. So in this use mammal, I want to take a look at what the mammal really is and I can do something different based on what it is. So I could say when mammal, and now I can use an exhaustive when expression on this. So let's actually uh, give it a value as well, value result. And inside here, notice that the when now gives an error saying, hey, he must be exhausted. So you have to add the, the appropriate stuff. Take a look at what it's saying down here. Add is cat, is dog, is human, or Seymour, or an else branch. Notice that the Seymour doesn't have an is, but these three have is. So what I'm going to do is alt enter on him and say add remaining branches. And boom, I now have an exhaustive when statement. If it's a cat, do this. If it's a dog, do this. If it's a human, do this. Or if it's exactly the value Seymour, because it's an object, there's only ever one value. He's a singleton. Do this. Now because of smart casting, Kotlin knows that if I am seeing this expression, and I execute this expression here, I know inside this expression over here, it's definitely a cat because it took a look at this cat and it says, oh, you already checked. I can make that assumption. Assuming that mammal is not mutable. In this case, mammal coming into the function, the parameters are all immutable. They're vowels. Therefore, when I come in here, mammal can't change. So once I've tested it, boom, I'm good over here. If, however, I were using a variable for it somewhere, like let's say I said var mammal, something kind of like this. Let's see what the difference is if I get rid of the parameter on this. So note that it's pulling in that property Let's take a look over here, and if I try to say mammal dot 
meow. If I float over mammal, he's going to say the smart cast is impossible because mammal is a mutable property and some other thread could have modified it in between the is cat check and the place where I'm actually using it as a cat. If, however, I had that as a parameter, boom, now it works just fine. So you'll notice here, this has kind of got a little green background, and if I float over it, it's going to say smart cast to cat. Because since the mammal cannot change, it's an immutable property, once I've checked it's a cat and gotten into this block, it's safe to say it's definitely a cat. So I can actually look at it and use it as a cat directly. Any questions on that? So here I'm going to say, whoops, actually I wanted to block there, mammal.meow, and maybe I'll return 42. And then the dog, I'm going to say dog, whoops, mammal.bark, and return 10. And then for the human, I'm going to say printlin mammal dot nickname and return five these numbers are totally meaningless and then for Seymour I'm going to say mammal dot sing isn't that what I called it oh huh. That's interesting. Unresolved reference sing. Looks like the smart cast isn't working if it's a value check. That's interesting. I mean, if I come in here and say Seymour.sing, I'll be just fine. That's really odd. I thought that would have worked, and I almost think I've done this in the past and it did work. But maybe there was a problem with that. Because we're not actually doing a type cast here. Because Seymour isn't a type, it's an actually in value for it. Um, that is really interesting. I could have sworn I've done something like this. I'll have to take a look, closer look at that at some point. Um, but because it's a single value, I can just go ahead and use the value name on it to make him sing. But I'm going to take a peek at that, because that... Um, I mean, obviously it's not a type check that we're doing here, but that it feels to me like I've done this before and it worked. So I'll just wave my hands at it at the moment and say I'll come back to it. Um, but what I've done now is I've exhaustively handled all types of mammals. So I've, I've handled the explicit mammal here, which is Seymour, and I've, ex I've handled these subtypes, and I can do something different with each one of them. And that's where this gets really, really nice. Uh, because uh, with the uh, enumeration, everything had to be the same type. And this is also what allows us to do that response thing that I was doing before, where we can check to see, is it actually a response coming back, and then get different fields than if it were an error. Otherwise, you end up with one big object that has a little flag to say if it was successful, and you'll have the error inside there, even if it's null. And I don't really like having extra stuff along for the ride. These sealed classes and sealed interfaces make this possible where you can just have subtypes and do things interesting with them and still be exhaustive okay any questions okay moving on so let's see what was the next thing i wanted to talk about with um i'm going to take this uh just a step further with um, objects. We've been talking about named objects here where you give it a name. This is actually an object instance. But keep in mind you can also say val Seymour equals object mammal with some definition changes inside of it like that. So I could have this same kind of stuff inside like that
Oh, never mind. It's a sealed class. Can't do that. <laughs> yeah, you have to have name types or classes to do that with, with sealed classes. Um, but if uh, we had just a normal interface and it wasn't a sealed interface, you'd be able to do something like this to actually define it in line and not have it be named, just treat it as a value. But because it's a sealed class, you can't do that. Highlighting is temporarily suspended due to internal error. That's interesting. Well, it seems like it's working. Yeah, have I mentioned that IntelliJ is a little on the buggy side? Okay, so uh, the next thing I want to do is we've been talking about those objects being named or being anonymous types. But you can also use something called a companion object. Let me come into here. I give myself a main. And I'm going to have a data class. Let's go with a person again here. And we'll have a val name and a val age, something like that. Now, suppose that we want to have some constants that we work with. So maybe we want to have a special birthday constant. And when you hit a special birthday, we announce it to the world or something like that. Now what I could do is come out here and define a constant, const val, special birthday equals 10. Let's say that 10 is your special birthday. And then down here, I could have some fun check birthday if age equals special birthday. I should say special age would make more sense, wouldn't it? Then Printlin root. So I can do something kind of like that using a constant. The drawback here is I'm now putting that constant in my public namespace. So it's accessible to anybody anywhere. It's not something scoped to person, and it doesn't necessarily feel like it's scoped to person or be related to person. So what I'd like to do is relate that to just person. Now, if, let's call this person one, if instead I move that inside, we'll call this person two, the first thing we're gonna see is that it doesn't like having a const here. It says const val are only allowed at the top level or inside an object definition at the top level. So I'm gonna make that a val. But let's think about what this is doing. I have now defined a property called special age, which exists inside every single person instance. That's probably not what I intended here. I'm taking up an extra four bytes here for every single person that I create. When I really only need that once, and up here, I only had this once and that was very cool. Not a problem at all, with the exception of it pollutes my overall namespace. Here, special age is only defined inside person, which is great, and this works just fine, but have a separate copy of 10 for every person instance. And that's not super great. So what we could also do is we could come down here and say, instead of it having the equal, I could have a get that returns 10 every single time. And this is person three. And that would be fine, but it really is doing this as a, a member function. It's really written in a way such that it refers to individual instances of the person. And we really just want it to be a top level thing. For example, if I tried to come down here and say, Printlin, the special age is, and tried to print that, if I said person three, whoops, dot special age, oh, wait a minute, I can't do it. There's no way for me to get to this unless I had a person instance.
So cannot access outside a person instance. And that, that can be a problem because now we cannot access that information. So a better way to do this is to create something called a companion object. And a companion object is a singleton, just like we've seen before. That, whoops, let's make this person four. That is associated with the person class. Now, the way I like to describe this, this is this is kind of similar. I'm gonna I'm gonna wave my hands a lot here and say kind of similar to statics in Java, but it's implemented quite a bit different. This is basically a little friend who hangs around with every possible person in the universe every possible person for, I should say. Um, this is uh, a separate singleton that's associated with the person. So I can get to that now. If I come down here and said the special age is person four dot special age, boom, I can reference that. And there's only a single instance of that kept around. So I could keep it with this get this way, which every time I'm asked gets returns a 10, or I could go ahead and assign it. Just kind of like that. But you're gonna notice there's a little squiggles here. If I float over the squiggles, he says might be const. So what's a const? Resolved by compiler, not taking up memory. So it doesn't actually get loaded into any type of memory. It's just a value that gets resolved by the compiler when it's referenced. So down here where it says age equals special age, it's just going to replace that with a 10. Boom. Now you're pretty limited in what you can use const on. It's going to be, you know, values like a null or zero or numbers, true, false, things like that. Um, you can't use it to represent an instance of an object. It has to be something that at compile time it can just replace directly in. So they can be pretty useful. And this is mostly what you'll use companion objects for, is to have something like this. Now once in a while you'll put some functions in there as well. But I recommend you keep it pretty thin. And if you want to define extra functions that go along with the person, pardon me, um, I would recommend making them top level extension functions on the person rather than having special functions inside here. For example, if we were to define a, um, let's say we wanna compare two people to say which person um, is older. So I could say something like fun is older taking person one, which is a type person four, and person two of type person four, and then say person one dot age is greater than person two dot age. So I could write something like that. And this is what you do a lot of times in Java. You'd have utility functions that you implement as static methods inside Java so that you have uh, one that isn't associated with specific data inside of a class, but you can use it kind of as utilities. And so we could say something like, let's create two people here. Person one, Scott and 54, 55. What age am I? Remember my age here. And we'll say Mike is 24, whoever Mike is. And then I can say Printlin person, whoops, person four is older, person one, person two. So you're probably gonna see a lot of functions like that, especially if you read Java code. And boy, that's gross. I mean, it's nice to have utility functions, but it just doesn't read well. So what we can do is we could either define inside of here an is older function. I'll call it is older one. And then we'll return age greater than other person dot age. So we could do something like that. Whoops. Let's do it like that. 
So I could define that as a member function. Can define add if have access to the source, aka own the class. So if you're the owner of that class, you're the, the one who developed it, you're the one who's providing it to the outside world, you can add new functionality. That's perfectly fine and actually have member functions. But let's say that you're not, if you don't own it, can't tweak it. I'm going to say unless you fork the code base. So there's every once in a while you'll find some code that you want to use but you have to tweak some things so you can create your own separate fork of it and maintain it on your own but then over time trying to keep that in sync with all the changes that are going on in the main code can be really painful so forking it isn't necessarily a good thing to do especially if you're just adding some new function with kotlin of course extension functions so I can now add to that, so this is my person four, I can have fun person four dot is older other person, person four. And then I can do the same kind of thing. Age is greater than other person dot age. And I've now added a function on top of there. Now, one thing to keep in mind is this is compile time resolved, so it can't really play in polymorphism. Um, it only takes into account the compile time version of the receiver. So it's not as flexible as a polymorphic situation. If you did it with subclasses, you're not going to get the behavior that you might want to uh, uh, think about. So if you tried to have a person four and then maybe doctor is a subclass of person four and had a fun doctor is older, it's not going to work. It's going to depend on just the compile time type of that receiver. So it's one thing you have to be careful about. The other thing you have to be careful about is you only have access to public information. Um, I, I shouldn't say just public, because if you're in the same package, there's ways to, to different protection modifiers other than public and private. Um, only have access to whatever the outside world could see in your context. How about that? How's that for confusing? So if we're in the same package, we might be able to access some things that people in a different package couldn't access. Um, but in many cases, this is fine. Those are perfectly fine restrictions. And it makes the code so much more readable. So now I could come down here and just say person one dot is older person two, kind of like that. And if you want to take it a little farther, which we'll see later on, I'm going to call this is older too. I could say infix fun person one is older, person four is older. And actually, I don't even need to create that. Well, I'll leave the other one here. I can now do this. And that's kind of cool. So you can make it look much more like normal language. And we're going to use this when we talk about domain specific languages to try to make it so that things read a little bit more friendly. And this it's very similar to we saw the to function when we were creating maps where you'd have key to value with the to. Uh, this little infix function here, you can call it either way. You can call it as a normal function call or you can call it just like that, which is pretty cool. Uh, I don't necessarily re recommend you do that all the time, but it, there's some times when that can make things pretty readable. Um, so my general recommendation is with companion objects, try to stick to really just constants. That's the main thing you want in there. You might have some uh, variables in there, like if you wanted to keep track of some overall values for all possible people, like maybe you're keeping track of the total age of all people. And then what you'd have to override the uh, the setter on the age in order to make sure you're recomputing them. Um, generally, don't recommend that, but sometimes there's a use for that. Um, if you have functions, try not to write them like this. I'm 
I'm going to say use extension functions instead. And the nice thing about extension functions is they can give you that chaining capability too. Uh, so if you wanted to do something and then return the same value again, so maybe if we wanted to print the name and then return it in a chain, I might say infix person four dot print name. I'll say print name and return me just to make it really explicit what's going on. I'm going to say apply println uh, name, something kind of like that. And keep in mind that apply is going to take in the receiver, which is this, pass it in, do something with that, and then return the receiver. Um, we could also, instead of reply, use run, and it'll do the same kind of thing. Um, run might actually make a little more sense. I usually like to think of apply as something that you're changing values, especially initialization. So now if I had this, I could do something like person one dot print name and return me dot take if age is greater than 10 oops it dot age is greater than 10 hello so that should be oh why does he That should be returning the value there. Huh. Wait a second. Oh, run returns the value in the block. I think it's also I meant. Yes, I meant also instead of run. So also will take the, you can see which ones I don't use as often. I use let and apply all the time. Uh, so also is gonna take the receiver pass it in as, as it, and then return the receiver. So now I can say print name and return me, take if, and then I can say question mark dot let do something with the person, Elvis run, do something with the underaged person. So we'll say that, you know, if they have to be 10 or older, or if they have to be uh, older than 10 to do something, if old enough, otherwise do something with the underage person. The take if, keep in mind that it says, if, take the uh, receiver, and if this predicate applies, return it, otherwise return null. And so that's that way you can use the uh, question mark uh, uh, the Elvis operator there. So this type of behavior here, whenever you use an extension function that ha that always that returns the this, you can put it into a chain like this, and that can be really useful once you get re used to reading these chains. Okay, any questions on that? Main point here is prefer extension functions versus just generalized utility functions that take arguments. Unless it makes, unless the way it reads makes more sense as a generalized utility function, um, for a lot of these things, you know, this older definitely reads a lot better when you have a receiver and a parameter versus having the two parameters like this. That's just kind of gross. This one is very readable. Person one is older than person two. It's obvious which one's which. Okay, any questions there? Okay, so that's companion objects. Um, let's see. Let's talk about some other stuff. Okay, I talked about constants. That's good there. Let's talk about some other stuff that you can do with interfaces. Now, fairly recently in Java, and I believe it was out of Java 8, which may not seem that recent, but it's still fairly recently in the Java history, um, they added in the idea of default function implementations and in interfaces. 
let's let's describe why this was a useful thing. And you can do the same thing in Kotlin. Um, in Java and Kotlin, you can have a single superclass versus C++, which can have multiple superclasses. And the reason they chose this is because it was just really gross when you're trying to choose implementations for things. Because if you had multiple superclasses, they could have the same functions inside of them, and you get conflicts. And that happens quite a bit when you have multiple superclasses. Also, let's think about what a superclass is. Generally, when you think of superclass, it's a is a relation. Subtypes are a specialization of a supertype. So a cat is a mammal, something like that. And what ended up happening quite a bit is that people would have the superclass being superclasses in C++ being used just to inherit functionality rather than to actually describe something is a something else. Interfaces define traits, which is just a things you can do or things you have. So we have like properties and functions defined for these. Things you can do or functions, things that you have or things that describe you. Are properties. And you can have multiple traits, and that's perfectly fine. Um, let's say that I defined an interface actor, and he might have a generalized act function. So that's just something I can do, I can act. And I might have an interface driver, and something I can do is drive. And maybe I have an interface called named, which has, oops, which has a val name string. And these are all traits that somebody can have. And you should be able to pull these all together by saying class person is an actor, a driver, and he's named, something kind of like that. And maybe for named, I'm going to implement it as construction constructor parameters. So I'll pull in the name. And note that I could actually make it a var. That'd be perfectly fine so that inside a person you can change it. But I'm still satisfying the need to have a git name, which is what the val does. Here, I'm not defining act or drive. So I need to put those in there. So let's go ahead and implement those as well. Implement members act and drive, boom, pull those in. And now he's a perfectly fine class. And so this allows me to pull in this functionality, but I have to implement it all. Now, when you're talking about traits, sometimes there might be a default way that you want to implement it or default way that you want to um, uh, use it. So that, you know, if you're setting up something that, um, oh, let's say, if you're, if you're driving, maybe your default implementation is to drive using uh, automatic transmission. But somebody could always change that to uh, drive using a standard transmission. So what I could do is define a default for this guy. Driving using automatic transmission. And I think I can probably fairly safely say that anybody who can drive could drive automatic, but only a subset who has actually taken the time to learn drives a stick shift. Um, but if you can drive a stick shift, you should be able to drive automatic. And maybe not. Maybe you're going to constantly move the gear shift, but let's just make the assumption that that's the case. Um, so here I'm going to say, you know, the default is you drive using automatic transmission. So when I have a person here, 
I could come down here now, let's call him person one. I could get rid of that implementation of drive and now I'm perfectly fine. I get this for free. That's pretty neat. But let's say it needs some data. Maybe I need to know what type of car I'm driving. So I could come in here and I could say, I need a car type string. Now I'd probably have a car be a separate class, but I don't want to go down a rabbit hole here. Um, let's just say that we have a string that represents the car I'm driving. I can now put driving dollar car using automatic transmission. Note that car doesn't have an implementation here. It's just the concept saying that anybody who's a driver has to have a car. They have to implement val car, which means that this interface knows it can reference car in any type of class that implements driver. So now I can require some data that I don't have a default for, and the implementation has to provide it, and use it in default functions. Now I could even have, let's say, um, let's do something like this. Let's say val make and model. So it might be like, this might be a Ford and the model might be a probe, which is the first class, the first car I drove. Awful, awful name for a car, but they were trying to be like space probe. Um, but uh, it was a very nice car. I really enjoyed it, uh, but horrible name. And let's say that we want the word car to be make and model put together by default. But, you know, we could override that if we wanted to. I could come in here and say get equals dollar make dollar model. Just like that. And now if the subtype has a make and model, I'm pulling those together using the getter inside car. So this is my default. Again, it could be overridden. So now person one, because he's a driver, he needs to have Hello. Actually, let's uh, implement as constructor parameters. So we're going to pull in make a model, just like that. And then, did I have my main inside here yet? No, I did not. Now I can say val person one equals person one, Scott, Ford. Actually, I'm going to say what I currently drive. Honda CRV. Okay, and so now if I say println person one dot drive, actually it, I don't need to do a println. I just going to say person one dot drive. Let's see what it says. Boom! Driving Honda CRV using automatic transmission. There we go. Now I could create a different person. I'll call it stick person, as in somebody who drives a stick shift. And he's going to have the same data, but I'm going to override drive to say println driving dollar car using stick uh, standard transmission. Something like that. And so now if I did the same kind of thing with a person two, which is a stick person, and I don't know if they make the CRV in that. Let's let's do the, the probe here. Why not? Because the probe I had was a stick. And now let's run that. And there we go, driving forward probe using standard transmission. So we can override pieces of it, or we can use the common functionality. And what this allows us to do, default uh, implementations in interfaces give us mixins. So we can now pull in implementations of traits just by referencing the interfaces. So we'll notice up here, we didn't have to implement the driver. We just pulled the data in there and it's not a superclass. So we don't have this person is actually of the subtype of driver. We're saying person has the same traits as a driver does. And we can pull those in from multiple places. 
and that's pretty useful. And whether you're implementing the uh, getters for these guys or the implementations of the functions, you can do either one. Now note that you cannot do something like that. Any of these properties cannot have backing fields in the interface. So you can't give an actual piece of data to hold. So the subtype still needs to explicitly override any of the properties that it wants to actually hold on to. But it's perfectly fine to say, I have a property here without backing fields. So by default, I define my git and I don't have a backing field on that. If they override it, they can give it a backing field or they can override the getter in the same way. Something kind of like that. Okay, so sometimes you can get into trouble with this. Sometimes multiple interfaces can have the same functions. So let's say, for example, that I had interface A. Well, let's call it this. Let's call it interface list. And I'm going to have a fun add taking an integer. So I might have a n, which is an int. And then let's say I also have an interface um, calculator, which has an add function. Now, a lot of times, if you have the same name, it'll be okay because you're really just trying to, to make sure that you have an add function. But in this particular case, whoops, I meant want to spell calculator properly. But in this particular case, these functions have different semantics. And so if we gave them some default implementation, that could be a problem. So let's say that we had this interface do something like we're going to require a var. Um, I'm just going to call it value. And then this add is going to say value plus equals n, which should work just fine there. Whereas up here, I'm going to say I have a val list. This is a really awful definition here, but bear with me. Let's call this int list. So we're just going to use a list under the covers. And then this one's going to say list.add n, something kind of like that. Oh, mutable list. Oh, no, we'll make it a var. Let's do it this way. Var list, blah, blah, blah. And we'll say list equals list plus n. That should work. So notice they're very different implementations. And if we try to pull both of these in, we're going to have some trouble. Now, in a real life application, these two, it's very unlikely you'd actually pull both of these in. But I'm just trying to give a little more contrast, realistic contrast on this. Um, just be aware, it'd be very rare that you'd ever want to have something implement both of these because they have very different purposes. And you usually want classes to be pretty single-minded about what their purpose in life is. Um, if we implemented both, we've got a problem. And let's see what that problem looks like. So if I said class stuff implements int list whoops, and calculator, we float over class stuff here. He's going to say stuff is not abstract and does not implement list. Um, wait a minute. Oh, oh, the, the list in that. Okay, we got to actually implement those. Let's implement those as members. So list and value. We'll just keep track of those. List equals empty list of int. And then value equals zero, 
Okay, so now we've implemented the, those parts, the abstract parts. But now if we float over this, it's going to say stuff must override add because it inherits multiple interface implementations. There's a conflict here. Compiler doesn't know which to use. So you need to be explicit. So if I came in here and I said override fun add taking in an int kind of like that, I need to give it an implementation. So I could say super calculator dot add n kind of like that. And what this is going to do is it's going to say use the implementation from calculator. That's what super calculator is doing. Calling that add inside super calculator, passing the add in, the n in, and boom. Now we could alternatively use the other one, obviously. Or maybe we don't want to choose. Maybe what we're going to do is do both things. Now again, for this example, it probably doesn't make a lot of sense, but we could even do this. So we could do the sum and maybe add it to list. So maybe you're trying to implement this thing that you just keep track of the values that the users entered, that the users added together. So maybe that does make sense here. I don't know. Um, I just created an excuse for why this is why this exists, and I'm almost happy about that. But it still feels a little gross. So we can call explicitly each of those superclass ones using the syntax super with the type that I want to deal with. And then that will forward it to the right one, which in this particular case, this add from the calculator will say add to the value. So the value should get updated here. This one says update my list, which should update that list up there. And so if I come in here and say main, and I'll do a val stuff equals stuff, and then we'll say stuff dot add four, add five, and then println stuff dot value. Whoops. Let's run him. Nine. And if we wanted to print the list as well, we could do that. We should see the four and five in the list. And there we go. So now we've actually implemented that functionality. And note that I didn't have to actually completely implement each of those inside of here. I'm just using the default functions that came in, default uh, implementations. Okay. Any questions on that? This allows us some composition of classes. So rather than thinking about class inheritance, which if you really are thinking of things as I am a subtype of something, and you know when you're thinking in terms of mammal is a superclass, dog is a subclass type thing, if that's really what you're thinking about when you're modeling your data, use that. That's fine. There's nothing wrong with it. If you're just using inheritance to pull in implementations, don't use superclasses because that is is really uh, giving that uh, feeling that I'm really meaning this to be a superclass subclass relationship. So, you know, I have the more general is my superclass and the more specific is my subclass. Um, using this, this is perfect for pulling in implementation details. Well, almost perfect. It's It's a good step in that direction because you're getting a lot of behavior that you can mix in. Now you can take this a step further. Let's say that we uh, really want to define the data in one specific way, rather than having every subtype have to define the data explicitly like we've been doing. Um, so if I came in here and I said interface named, and maybe what we do in this is we're going to say I require to have a first name, which is a string, and a last name, which is a string. And then I'm going to have a 
well actually let's make those be vars and then I'm going to have a val called full name which is a string as well and let's just say that that's my interface so I'm not going to have any defaults in there I could define the defaults for the full name that'd be fine if I wanted to um, but let's say I don't for now and I'm going to say default named or let's call it name helper how about that we'll call it name helper and he is going to implement named so I'm going to implement these members um, yeah we'll just do them internal members we could pass them in as constructor parameters if we want to but I'm just thinking we're going to have these available and the user's going to be able to set them and get them so first name is going to be a string last name is going to be a string full name I'm going to go ahead and have it give us a whoops I need a some default values here so the full name is going to be dollar first name and then dollar last name something like that so that gives me some let me call this named helper one and let's do a name helper two which uses constructor parameters something kind of like that the advantage of the constructor parameters here is that I can force the, uh, the the caller who's creating this to pass those values in so here's two possible implementations of this name helper here let's use this name helper so if I define a class person and I want the person to be a named thing let's call this person one and I want it to be a named one, I just named, yeah. And I want it to be a named guy. I can use this helper to implement named for me. And let's see how we might do that very, very directly. I'll call it person 1A. So I might have inside of here a private val, uh, what did I call it? Name helper one equals name helper one. So he's just a little object we're using to store that information. And then I can implement these functions. So first name, last name, and full name. But what I'm going to do is I'm just going to delegate these to that name helper. So I'm going to come in here and say git is going to be name helper one dot first name. Set is going to be name helper one dot first name equals value. Something kind of like that. Let's do the same thing for last name. And then for full name, I can do the same kind of thing. Name helper one dot full name. And this is a very explicit delegation. use the helper object to manage the names and we're just directly passing everything through all calls to the interface the named interface functions are passed to the helper helper is called a delegate so we're delegating functionality to him letting him do some management on our on our behalf and this is a pattern that you'd see quite a bit where people would say I want to pull in functionality from other objects in this case from this name helper and I'm implementing this interface but I don't want to pollute my superclass I don't want to force a superclass to be named because that may not make any sense so I'm saying that I implement the name traits using this little helper and this is such a common pattern that they actually built it into the language. And this is something that a while ago, um, do I still have the documentation anywhere? Um, I don't know if this, it definitely doesn't work, but um, let's see if this, No, 
Oh, that's a really old. No, that's that's not it either. Um, I, I had an annotation process that I wrote, and it's uh, it used to be hosted at Google Code, and then that ended up breaking. Um, yeah, I, I don't have an example I can show you, I don't think, here. Um, unless there's something here. Oh, maybe an annotation sample. Let's see, I might have found something. Um, ah, yes, here we go. Okay, so let me bring him over. There. So I wrote an annotation processor a while ago to do this with Java, where I could say I'm defining this travel agent who is extending uh, a little helper class. And what I've done is I'm saying I want to delegate this interface, iHotel, to an implementation of hotel agent. I want to inter help delegate this interface to the car agent impl. I want to delegate this interface to the flight impl. And then it would generate the same type of code that I just wrote up. It would create instances of hotel agent impl, car agent impl, and final uh, flight agent impl, and then all those little helper functions to delegate. Uh, and that was great. I used this for a little while. Um, I haven't maintained this thing in years, so uh, it, I'm sure it's not working anymore. Uh, I think I, I lost the original code for it. Um, but it would generate similar code like this. Um, in Kotlin, they actually built it in at the language level. You don't have to use an annotation processor. So what we can do is we can define class person1b is going to be named by name helper1. Or, uh, yeah, there we go. Paren, paren. Boom, and there we go. This is a class delegation. I'll say interface delegation. That's it. Does exactly the same as above, but you don't need to explicitly write delegation functions. And this gets really nice because now note that the person 1B doesn't have to implement those properties. They're being taken care of for him, encapsulated inside this name helper 1. And the really nice thing there is that he can't get it wrong. So if there's any type of interplay between how you intend these properties to be used, like in this particular case, we really intend the full name to be first name, last name like that. So having this name helper really makes all the difference in the world there. We can delegate to it and boom, that's so much nicer. Now, if we take a look at that second one that has the parameters. So if I have person two by name helper two. Now name helper two has some constructor parameters and we'll see if we float over this here He's going to complain saying we're not passing in the first name or passing in the last name. So in this case, if, is this going to work? Let's see. Um, no, it looks like it's not going to give me a nice option for that, unfortunately. I was hoping that when I hit Alt-Enter here, it would say add parameters to constructor. It's giving me a chance to get a secondary constructor here, so I can come down here. Oh, that's actually adding it to this guy. No, we don't want that. We didn't want to add the secondary constructor there. Um, so what we really need to do here is set it up so that person has those values and passes them through. So I'm going to say first name is a string and last name is a string, and then just pass them in. First name, last name, just like that. And now I can use that second one forcing somebody to specify the first name and last name. So there's no way you can create this person without a name at this point. I mean, you could, of course, pass in blanks for it, but we could put an initializer in here. 
something kind of like require, is there a check? Is that the name of the function? Um, check can throw an exception. Let's actually do a require. So I could say require first name is not empty. Let's say blank actually, because that'll that'll allow us to check to see if it's actually uh, got just blanks in it or if it's completely empty. And last name is not blank. Just kind of like that. So we could add in that extra little check. And if someone tries to pass those in, they blow up. Let's see how that works. I didn't have a main in here, did I? Nope. Okay. So I'm going to say val person2 equals person2 Scott. And let's try to put in the blank and see what happens. We should get an exception. I believe it's an illegal argument exception. Oh, failed requirement. Is, yeah, legal argument exception, failed requirement. There we go. Something kind of like that. Or if I pass in stanch field, it works just fine. If I put in a bunch of blanks, it's going to give me that same failed requirement thing. So you could do things like that to kind of help out a little bit. Um, but this is a really nice way to pull in traits with default implementations. And you don't have to worry about explicitly implementing those, those properties yourself. Um, one of the things that is just a slight bit awkward on these interfaces is that when you have properties, you still have to implement them. But this gets around it. It gives you the default implementation, and then you just delegate to it. And we can do that with any number of things. So we could have a interface. Um, oh, let's say. Uh, Postgrad. And well, I don't wanna, let, let's actually do this um, degrees. Or degree. And then inside here, I'll say val level and we'll say bachelor uh, masters PhD something like that and so that'll be degree level and then val concentration. I'm just going to be a string, something kind of like that. And then we could have implementations of these. So maybe I have a class um, master's degree, which is going to be a degree, and implement constructor parameters just for the concentration. And then implement this inside. Hello. Android, or not Android Studio, IntelliJ was just kind of hanging there for a moment. And, oops. And then we could do something similar for Wow, I'm just having spelling issues today. And this is going to be Bachelor and then PhD, maybe something kind of like that. So that gives us some default implementations for these things. And I can say, uh, what did I say, De uh, degree by PhD. Actually, let me say it's me, because I've got my master's in computer science. Something kind of like that. So now I've attached that. So if somebody asks the person what their degree is, I'm going to come down here and say println person2 dot uh, wait a minute. 
Oh, I put it in the wrong spot. I put the pers person one there. Let's add that also into here. Whoops, that wasn't it either. I wanted it in person two. So person two dot uh, do, 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 do. in dollar. It's not going to read quite right, but close enough. And so now when I run this, I see that I pulled in that. Um, uh, I, I pulled in that other trait. So you can kind of encapsulate traits this way by having these default implementations and everything. Make some sense? Any questions there? Now, I think, yeah, if you want, you could even scope these more by using a companion object inside there. Or can we have inner classes inside those? I think. That work? Yeah, that should work. So if we define inner classes here, now we've scoped them. So now we can say degree dot master's degree. You'll notice down here that it doesn't like just master's degree by itself. But now we're reducing our namespace so that the master's degree isn't in the public namespace anymore. Something kind of like that. Okay, any questions on that? So I don't normally recommend that you put inner classes inside of interfaces unless you know you're very restricted on what the implementations are. And if so, I would strongly recommend you go with sealed classes instead. So that way somebody wouldn't be able to extend these any further. Or sealed interface, I should say. So if we did something like that. Now we're not only scoping them, so that they aren't in the top level namespace but we've now restricted it so that nobody else can implement degree outside of this module okay and i it used to be that they required sealed interfaces and sealed classes to use inner classes inside there um, but i think let me just try something Yeah, it's just that we need to implement the uh, values in there. Yes, yeah, so you can still specify it. I was kind of hoping that maybe they set it up so that if you did define them inside, then you can't define them outside, but that's not the case. It's still just restricted by the module. Um, that might be a good enhancement request, although at this point uh, it's probably too late because people may have implemented things inside and outside at the same time. but. Personally, I think it would be really nice if you specified the, the implementations of the sealed interface inside the interface like this, that you can't do it outside because then you can't kind of screw yourself up inside the same module accidentally. Okay, any questions on that? I think that covers all the content that I wanted to talk about today. Um, let's go ahead and take a break. Uh, let's say at uh, five after nine, we'll start back up. And if anybody has any questions on the uh, the test, um, not necessarily, you know, if you have format questions, I can answer those. But um, and I'm not going to say which specific topics are on the test. Anything that we've covered in class is is uh, valid for uh, for uh, being on the on the exam. Um, but if you have questions on like certain concepts that um, you know maybe weren't super clear, or maybe you still have questions about them. We can talk about those after the break. Okay, <clears throat> we are back. So I just sent out an announcement just reminding everybody that there's no homework this week because of the midterm uh, and that the midterm is next week. The midterm will uh, be from 7.30 to 9.30 p.m. EST uh, next week. You can find it underneath the assignment submission section on Blackboard. You won't see it yet because I haven't released it. Um, and uh, I recommend that you take a look at the transcripts. Let me just go ahead and bring a video over here so you can kind of see what that looks like. So there's a video. 
And if I click on this little dot, 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 there's this open transcript button here. That will open up a little transcript window. And if you do a search, just to, just to you know, normal control F, let's say that I wanted to look for um, application. So it'll then highlight that here. Now I know that the search will also look on the rest of the page as well, but I think they have it set up to search here first. Uh, so then as you look through here, you can click on what you're interested in and it'll jump to that spot. Um, it may also be useful to kind of skim this. Just keep in mind that the accuracy of their trans their uh, generation of this is you know, maybe 80 to 90%. Um, so there's going to be some things that are going to look a little bit weird. Uh, but it's it's good to like, you know, just kind of skim over it quickly just to see here's some topics that we've covered, things I've talked about. Um, and if there's specific things that you want to go back and review, this is one way where you can find those uh, pretty easily. And so, you know, you find where it is, jump to that section, and then you can listen to me prattle on for a while about it. Um, any questions on that? Okay, any, any questions on any content we've covered so far? Or just the exam in general? What is the format of the exam? Uh, it's going to be an online exam in Blackboard, and there are uh, a few different types of questions. Um, there are going to be multiple choice questions. Um, some of them will be choose one answer. Some will be choosing multiple answers. Uh, I believe I'm using like five answers for all of them. Um, there might be some that's more than five answers. I think there's there's a few more like that. So the multiple choice are one one category of them. Short answers will be another one where, you know, basically, you know, small paragraph type thing. Um, or, you know, if you can answer it in five words, five words would be perfectly fine for short answer. Um, be careful not to go too short because if I can't understand what you're trying to say or if I have to infer too much, then I'll, I'll take off points for it. Um, but, uh, you know, I, I might ask you things like, um, oh, you know, what is a, a Kotlin Lambda or something like that? Um, that's not one of the, the questions, but uh, if I ask that, you would want to describe in general what a, what a Lambda is, why you might want to use it, that type of thing. Um, some questions will ask you for pros and cons on things. Those might be slightly longer answer questions uh, where, you know, I might say, you know, what are, you know, what are the, the, the pros and cons of a certain feature? Uh, and in that case, I want you to describe to your understanding, you know, what makes this a good feature, what makes this a bad feature, things like that. Um, I'm not going to do too much comparing Java and Kotlin unless I really talked about it. So there might be something that I might ask for, you know, can you do this in both languages or not? Um, I don't think I have any questions like that, but I, I still am going to tweak the exam uh, during this week. Um, I'm also going to have programming questions. So there'll be two programming questions. Uh, you can use uh, your IntelliJ to go ahead and write up your code, make sure it works, and then submit it. Um, and when you submit it, you're actually pasting it into Blackboard. Um, if you prefer to just write the code without testing it, that's fine too. I'm not going to be compiling it. I'm just going to be reading through it to see if it sounds reasonable. Um, so if there's minor issues com compilation-wise, don't worry about it. Um, but I would recommend you use IntelliJ. I think it's a lot easier that way because then it, it gives you the chance to try things out. Don't get perfectionist on it, though. Um, whatever you do, don't sit there and you know try to optimize something or try to find the absolute best way to do something. You know, do what the question is asking for, um, and uh, you know, then submit it because you don't want to get bogged down time-wise because those the, those two questions can eat you alive time-wise if you're not careful. Um, and let's see, what was the other? I think there was uh, one other type of question and I can't remember. For the multiple answers, do we get partial credit? Yes. So uh, if, for example, it's there's four options and you, know, you have to choose, you know, whichever ones are correct and Let's say you choose one that's correct and one that's incorrect, you'd get 50% um, of it. I think that because you know the ones that you don't choose count as valid, and then the 
the ones that you get wrong count as partial. Um, I think that's how I set them up. Um, Blackboard makes it a little tricky to do, so it might not be quite exactly like that. Um, they, they try to do a percentage on it. Um, but uh, you know, depending on how it looks, sometimes I'll bump the points up or down based on what Blackboard gives, just because it's usually a little fuzzy on how Blackboard does those types of questions. Um, but yes, you do get partial credit. Um, you know, Ideally, choose all the right answers and don't choose any of the wrong answers. Um, I would try to give those ones just a little bit more time to you know, take a second glance at. Um, the ones where there's one answer, usually, you know, single answer, multiple choice aren't too hard to get right because you can usually narrow them down. And if you have to guess, you know, you, you have fewer answers. Um, and sometimes there's a very obvious answer. Um, now, it was asked before if it's okay to use the web while you're doing this exam. And obviously, there's no way for me to stop you. Um, and I'm not asking you to sign an honor pledge to not do it. Um, I recommend that you don't just because sometimes you can spend a lot of time searching for an answer, whereas if you just happen to know it, boom, you run right through it. Um, back when I wanted to be a math teacher, like in college, I was trying to decide if I want to be a teacher or if I want to be a programmer. Um, and at that point, I ended up choosing programming because I didn't realize that this type of teaching was an option. Um, my thought in my head for being a math teacher is I wanted all my exams to be open book. Um, was it a question or something? or? Hello? I thought I heard something. Um, but the thought in my head is that I wanted all my uh, tests to be open book because it's really, a, you know, looking stuff up in a book, that's what real life is like. You look stuff up if you don't know the answers. And uh, really what it was about is being able to apply. You know, learn, what, learn how these things work. You can look up a formula if you need to, but do you understand how to apply it and when to apply it? Uh, and that's really kind of where I wanted to go, but when I made that judgment in college, it's like, well, you know, I can do better money-wise by uh, programming. And then I just got lucky in the 90s that I, I stumbled into a job where I got to fly around teaching people. And now I get to teach at night and program during the day. So it's the best of all worlds. Um, so anyway, um, but yes, uh, uh, multiple answer questions, you get partial credit. Um, other questions? Yes. Um, I can't remember how Blackboard does that during the cutoff. I think it's just whatever your last saved question was. Your last save answer is saved. Uh, but if you're in the middle of something, I think it might cut you off. I could be wrong. Um, I'm trying to, to figure out exactly how I want to do this because I know somebody uh, mentioned that they wouldn't be able to be there right at 7.30. And so I was going to try to set it up so that for that person, I have a two hour window that starts a little bit later. Um, but uh, yeah, I'll have to take a look at that to see. Um, I may just end up having it open and manually shut it off, um, but uh, we'll have to see how that goes. I, I'm not quite sure how Blackboard handles that because I haven't been on the receiving end of it. Yeah, I would also recommend, yeah, I'd also recommend, it sounds like um, uh, constructors are a bit of a question. Um, did you get a chance to read that article I had on Java Dude? So if, I'm hoping too. I just, <laughs> I just haven't had a chance. Um, and uh, I'm, I'm also trying to, to look for another job right now as well. Um, still going to keep teaching, but uh, I, 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 you know, gotten a little tired of what I'm doing at APL, so I want to kind of move on. Um, 
but um, this article, I think, does a really good job of describing the constructors and things like that. Um, the main thing to think about here is that uh, Kotlin has some extras on top of what Java does, but a lot of it is basically doing exactly what Java does. Um, so if, if you think about the uh, if a really basic class here, and maybe we, we're just going to define this exactly as we would in Java. Um, so if I kind of did an analog of it, um, I might have a whoops, var name string and a var age int and Whoops. And if we looked at the Java equivalent on that, we would have a string name at, oops, equals double quotes, int age equals zero, and then a public void set name. And a set age. And then maybe we'll have a get age, which is an int. And then a get name, which is a string. So um, defining just these two is the equivalent of doing all this in Java. So it's, it's a very direct mapping there. Um, and then if we wanted to add in constructors, we could add in a, a constructor very similar to what we would do in, in Java. So we might have a constructor that has name, string, age, int. Um, the main difference with the constructor, though, is that the body isn't defined with the actual declaration of the constructor. The body of the constructor is these init blocks. So every constructor here is either going to forward to the primary constructor and then call init, or if there's no call to the primary constructor, which would be a call to this here, um, it'll just go through the body directly. So this is where we might say this.name equals name, this.age equals age. And so the Java equivalent there is going to be public person name, oh, string name, int age, and then this.name equals name, this.age equals age. Uh, so kind of at its core, there's a real direct correlation between how you would construct things in Kotlin and how they work in Java. Um, the, what is he unhappy about here? Variable age is assigned to itself. Um, oh, uh, parameter age is never used. Oh, it's because I don't have a primary constructor up there. So I actually have to, it's so rare that I define secondaries. There we go. And mm, let me throw just another parameter in here just for, um, well, we'll say that the age is going to be defaulted. Something like that. Um, yeah, the inits only have access to the things that are defined in the primary constructor. And then secondary constructors are always defined in terms of the primary constructor. Um, yeah, I almost never use those. Usually you can get away with having default values on the primary constructor and not need secondaries. Uh, but every once in a while you have subsets of values. If, like in the article, uh, I, I talk about uh, setting up subsets of values, which is where the secondaries really come in handy. Um, but this basically acts the same as that, prim as that um, uh, constructor in Java. Now, the shorthand of actually defining vars up inside here just gets it so you don't have to define the word name twice. So where we have a class shorter person, I'll say terse person. Um, in here, I can just throw these guys up there. Whoops, there we go. Kind of like that. 
and boom, now we have our primary constructor which explicitly defines those and does this for you automatically. Uh, so it's really doing the exact same thing that this is doing. It's just instead of having to, to specify name twice and then have this this dot name equals name, this dot age equals age, we just do it all in the constructor. So it's a really nice shorthand is really all it's doing. Uh, but behind the scenes, it ends up doing the exact same thing. Cool. Mm -hmm. Yeah, good idea. So, because those those really are the backing fields, or what we call the backing fields in Kotlin. So yeah, having private on those is a good idea. The way I defined them without that, they'd be accessible to anything inside the package, which would be bad. No problem at all. Other questions? And if you all think of questions between now and Tuesday, I'm going to be doing office hours on Tuesday. And feel free to ask questions on any topics we've covered, uh, just for some clarification. Um, you know, If not, have fun with the exam. Um, but uh, if we're comfortable with the homework, should we be fine with the midterm and final? Yes. Yeah, if you were comfortable doing the homeworks and did well in the homeworks, you should be just fine with it. Um, the uh, now keep in mind, like the the written questions um, may have some other stuff that you'll just have to pick. You'll have to remember from the the uh, uh, the classes. You know, like if I ask you things about you know describe object oriented programming, for example, um, you know you'll you'll want to know some of that stuff from the lecture when I talk about object oriented programming. And then next term, we talk about functional programming. Uh, but uh, yeah, so the, you know, most of this is going to be uh, things that you know we worked with in the homeworks. I worked with in the sample code. So definitely look over the sample code as well. Um, and uh, I try not to get too obscure on the, the finals and the midterms. You know, I won't go down in there and say, you know, what musical did I sing a line from in the last session? I won't do stuff like that. Um, but uh, yeah, I, I, I recommend that you take a look at the sample code and your assignments, go over those. Make sure you're comfortable with them. Make sure you're comfortable with the comments you got back. Um, and you know, feel free to ask questions between now and then. Um, you know, in general, try to use the forums or you know, go to. Uh, <laughs> Can you please ask a question about your age? Yeah, nobody knows my age. You'd never be able to know my age. <clears throat> um, I've never let that information out. Um, that would be really, really easy. Yeah. <laughs> yeah give me another, uh, what car I drive. Yeah, you know the car I drive now. So, uh, you know, you'll, you'll see me on the road and say, oh, it's that person. <laughs> um, but, uh, yeah, or my name. What's the instructor's name? Yeah. Um, but yeah, I mean, it, it shouldn't be super hard. I mean, you know, honestly, the, the hardest questions are probably going to be the, the multiple answer ones. Those are the ones that usually catch people the most. So, you know, just when you're looking at those, pay close attention because sometimes those get detailed. Um, usually those will be questions along the line of here's a, here's some sample code which lines have errors on them or something like that. So you're going to see some questions like that. Uh, so looking at the code, you know, if you see something that's an obvious error, mark it on the line. Um, and uh, let's see, was there anything else? Actually, I'm going to, on the side over here, I'm just going to bring up the exam from last term without you guys seeing it. And, whoops, I was actually trying to take the exam. I don't want to take the exam. Um, let's come into here, see if I can edit it. And I'm just going to take a quick peek. Logic error, syntax error, compilations, or all of the above. Yes. Um, some of them will be cons. So uh, let's see. Um, da -da -da -da. Um, so yeah, one thing that like a, one of the short answers is going to be describing some things that, uh, you see wrong in some code. So you'll have to actually just write down some things. And, uh, I think I usually say like describe at least five, 
and uh, there might be more than five things wrong, but you want to describe everything that you see that's a problem. Um, you have to write a little program. Um, let's see, what does this one do here? Um, it's really hard to read the way the thing is set up here. Blackboard is just awful. Uh, okay, so there you may see some, some functions written down and then several statements. Oh, Blackboard is awful. We're actually switching uh, for the summer. It's going to be Canvas which looks much, much nicer. Now, I'm sure there'll be its own issues, uh, but uh, I'm going to be thrilled to get out of Blackboard because I've hated it ever since we started. Um, so there are there are some questions I have where it's like, take a look at a function and which of the following statements is true about that function. So that might be one of the multiple choice ones. Um, undergrad switch from BB to Canvas, night and day difference. Good, good. I'm glad you like it. I'm, I'm hoping that everybody likes it. Um, and if you if you see problems when we're using it, you know definitely let us know because sometimes there's just settings we can tweak. And when we first switch over to something, there's bound to be some settings that are harder to work with than others. Um, so we got some of those where you take a look at some code and you have to describe you know which things are actually valid based on it. Um, there's other ones where you basically just have to uh, choose what does this function do type thing. And let's see. Yeah, which statements are true? What's true about the following? I have a lot of what is the true about the following in this exam from last term. I'm going to be tweaking some things, but I'm, I'm going to probably do about the same number of stuff. Um, there's a couple questions where I say, if you change some line, how would that affect the function? And so you'll choose some uh, some answers based on that. And a few choice questions about, uh, you know, certain keywords in Kotlin. So, you know, which, are the, which is true about an interface or something like that. Um, yeah, that, that pretty much covers it. And... The short answers are five points each. The essay ones are 15. So those are the program ones. And I have two of those. And then the multiple choice and multiple answers are either two or three points each, depending on the question. Um, the exam from last term had 24 questions. I may stick with the same number. It just depends on how evenly I can split up the points when I get up to that, that spot. Uh, I think 24 questions worked out pretty well. Okay, any other questions? And again, if you think of any, please come to office hours on Tuesday or ask on the, uh, uh, the, the forums and you know, I can answer any questions. You know, if there is a topic, you know, like we just talked about uh, constructors here, if there's a topic that you want a little more clarification on? Feel free to ask. That's that's great. You know, I, I'm happy to help out there because um, you know, who knows that may show up on the exam, or it's always good to have a good understanding of it so that you know when you're doing your other assignments, you can feel more comfortable with it. So there won't be any homework this week. There won't be homework next week, uh, but then after the next class, we'll have it again. So I think there's going to be a total of nine assignments. Then I think that works out because we've done five so far. And then there's four weeks that we can do assignments after the exam. So yeah, that would be right. Okay, any questions? Well, that sounds like a no. So you guys are gonna get a half an hour back today. Woo, exciting. Um, good luck studying for the exam. And again, if you have any questions, let me know. And, uh, you know, it'll be so much fun this time next week when you're done with the exam. You're going to be like, ah, oh, thank God it's over. And then you're going to worry until you get the exam responses. I try to grade them pretty fast. So you may see them the next morning. 
because um, I don't like students that have to sweat over it. Okay, well, have a wonderful night, and I will see you for the exam next week.